And we're live. I'm with my brother, Mr. Armani Crawford. Uh, sure. I got to tell y'all a little bit about him before we get into the text of the day. You know, we always got a text. Today is... Light on the gas. Light on the gas. Light. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> <laughs> so he's, he's already... He's already ready for the gassing and sizing, which we're known to do because we edify one another. We build one up in an era and a time where people like to destroy and cut each other up. If anything, if we're going to have excess, we like that excess to be in the gas, to be in, <laughs> in the size. And so uh, our brother years ago, probably around 2010, 2011, we were in school together. We went to two of the same schools within the same larger school. We went to Pepperdine University School of Law and we went to Pepperdine University's undergraduate campus, Seaver College. During that time in my junior year, his freshman year, we really got closer. We first met on a ping pong tables, seeing this man's talents in ping pong, in playing the piano, in singing and writing his own music, in dunking a basketball and in playing an intramural basketball, but it didn't stop there. He was also a man of God who didn't mind spending nights with me and him and a few other friends where we would gather. This is a time where a lot of my peers had just recently turned 21 and were deciding to go more in the nightlife. And the Lord, if I could use the Ezekielian language, was removing my heart of stone and, and placing that mm. heart of flesh in me. And so I wanted to spend more time with people with the word. We're a diverse group. I I'll let him tell a little bit about it too, but he's from the Church of Christ background. I think we had so a Reformed Anabaptist and uh, a Baptist as well as me, the Orthodox who didn't go to church. And they gave me one of the sternest admonishings and rebukes that I love that, that set me on fire because I was, I was on fire and self-identifying as an Orthodox, but I was not actually going and participating in the life of the church. And they told us, yes, wherever two or three are gathered, like you like to retort, mm. he is here and present. However, you need to go to church. You know, right. they quoted Ice Cube and they told me to go to church. So I eventually came back into the church and uh, the rest is, is history. But yeah, uh, Armani, why don't you tell us just a little bit about the faith background in which you grew up and then we'll jump into the Obadiah text. Oh yeah, I grew up uh, in the faith tradition, the, the Churches of Christ, um, which comes out of the Restoration Movement that uh, happened in the New Testament. And their their whole kind of theological tilt is um, definitely high emphasis on scripture. Um, uh, and so I grew up like really knowing a lot about the word and, and our fellowship was big on like youth rallies. And so there'd always be Bible books where we would take certain books of the Bible uh, and just study them and then we would go and have competitions against other churches from other states And so the Bible was just a big part of my upbringing. And so I thought Foundationally, I grew up knowing a lot about scripture. Um, but but quite in, in all honesty part of my traditions uh, leanings is that we sometimes in leaning into like the actual text sometimes we lean away from the spirit mm -hmm. uh, and it, It's not necessarily always intentional, but that's just um was a part of my tradition so it wasn't until college and, and many of the moments you talked about where um and that was kind of the period of my life at pepperdine where i went from knowing a lot about god from scripture to getting to like just know him like it went from like having a lot of knowledge to like an actual relationship um, that's right yeah you i heard you say a couple things there that i think uh stick out to me the first is it, it sounds like you had recitation like competitions yeah. like you like memorization of the scripture yeah. is that right yeah memorization and then also something called bible bowls which is we for we had a couple months to study a book of the bible and then there'd be competitions with other churches where they would ask questions and you have a team kind of like a you have a, a team and then we'd have to answer like ring a bell and try to answer before the other team some obscure fact about that book or so. i love that it's like it's like taking that competition or that competitive spirit that you have and then setting on fire. Actually, that tradition is huge mm. in Judaism and in Islam as well. Mm. This this kind of emphasis, yeah, on, on recitation. They regularly have competitions even today in like the state of Israel and various Arab countries about people's ability to do that. And I think it's very itself textually based. If you examine Psalm 1, where many translations in English say you meditate, 
or mm. the, you know, it's talking about the blessed man. And he says one right. of the, the many things the blessed man does besides avoiding certain evils mm. is that he meditates on the law mm. or the instruction or the teaching mm. day and night. Mm. And mm. another, you know, different biblical interpreters have said that a better translation rather than meditate, because, you know, with the new wave movement since the 60s and 70s, yeah. meditate could mean so many different things. We got yogi yeah. brethren, too. Uh, yeah. You know, they got different forms of meditation. But okay. this meditation is actually like recitation to make mm -hmm. sure that it's applied to like how you were saying, not just have information, but mm -hmm. have applied knowledge, which, you know, in biblical language would be wisdom. In the Greek, mm -hmm. Sophia, in, in the Hebrew and Arabic, the Hukmana. Um, yeah. but that, that, that wisdom that, that we need to attend to. So I, I really like that. And you also mentioned the spirit, which I think again, it is so funny. It shows that your, the language you use is itself lathered in scripture. So you're using scriptural language, even when you speak, because the spirit is that, that great Pauline dichotomy between the letter of the law and the spirit. And by spirit, I imagine you mean interpretation. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's, is that right? You mean uh, yeah. the interpretation? Both and so a part of it I was speaking was definitely in, in regards to interpretation, but also I think just the life of the spirit. Um, for, for a number of reasons within my particular tradition, the like the robust life of the spirit that that I, I think is in fact offered through Christ and is is uh, testified to throughout scripture. Um, just in my particular church and upbringing in our tradition, the the life of the spirit wasn't as emphasized as much. I think the spirit was still always moving, but just in terms of how, like, of, of what was coming from our pulpits, of kind of how we oriented ourselves, um, it, it wasn't as spirit filled as some other traditions. And uh, and so that just, that wasn't a bad thing because I came, I had a, a, a pretty substantial biblical understanding. I knew the Bible fairly well, but uh, mm -hmm. like I said, it was that season of life that you actually mentioned earlier that I went, I, I kind of got introduced more and more to the life of the spirit. Um, and and realizing what these things are attesting to can be a part of my reality as well. Oh yeah, it made me it made me think critically. I remember one guy cornered us in the Hawk, this recreational facility where Armani and I used to play ping pong. And he, I mean, he really cornered me, this random dude. I, I don't even remember his name. And he told me that I had no salvation unless I had the gift of tongues. And mm -hmm. I've never even encountered any idea <laughs> close to that ever in my life. Mm -hmm. And, and, since I've encountered a few close to that, but never quite as explicit yeah, and right. direct as that. And I was like, man, this guy lost his mind. I, I don't know what he's, I don't know where he's from, what he represents, but I know that that's not what I believe and that's not what I follow on. So I like that alignment to the way that you're living mm -hmm. with uh, the scripture itself. Often, you know, the early biblical schools of interpretation had, had within it, I think, that that model especially the one of antioch the school of antioch they were famous for considering everything in scripture an edifying mm -hmm. story that if it's falling on deaf ears mm -hmm. is irrelevant like it has to apply in your life the way we're living has to be a reflection of that otherwise you know we're the whitewashed wombs uh excuse me whitewashed tombs or the whitewashed walls um so i think that's a, that's a great introduction now let's get into the book of Obadiah, which is itself a part of the, the scroll or the book of the 12, these mm -hmm. minor prophets towards the end of the Old Testament in most of our Christian Bibles. In the Hebrew Bible, it actually is in the middle. Uh, they, they actually organizationally or canonically put it in the middle and they end on what they call the writings. They end on like Chronicles, mm -hmm. uh, which is a little bit different than ending on like Malachi. Right. So they switch the order up a little bit. Um, but Obadiah is within that book of the 12, originally put with, uh, you know, Joel and with Jonah, the more famous and, and Hosea into yeah. one book or one scroll together. Yeah. And here we have this fragment. It's just one chapter. It's itty bitty. I, I like it because I call it one of those confidence boosters. Yeah, you know right. what I'm saying? You're like, oh, I read a whole book of the Bible today. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, today, bro. <laughs> oh man. Whether it's Philemon. Right. or whether it's Jude or whether it's Obadiah. So I think it would be great if I if I read the text. So you you let me know how many verses to read. We'll read it and then we could have a, a little conversation around that. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, well, let's start. Uh, my Bible has like headings. Uh -huh. So my first heading is from Obadiah 1, 
uh, verse one through nine, and that's entitled Edom Certain Judgment. Oh, perfect. Uh, what version are you reading from, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, that's is very good. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible, which is, has the Charles Spurgeon uh, commentary throughout. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So well, let's go one to nine. Mm -hmm. The vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord to uh, thus says the Lord God to Edom. I heard a report from the Lord, and he sent out a message to the nations, saying, Arise, and let us rise up against her for battle. Behold, I have made you least among the nations. You are greatly dishonored. The arrogance of your heart exalts you, dwelling as you do in the clefts of the rocks, as one overconfident in his habitation, saying in his heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? If you should ascend as the eagle, and if you should make your nest amongst the stars, from mm. there I shall bring you down, says the Lord. If thieves come upon you or robbers by night, then to what place will you escape? Will mm. they not steal a considerable amount for themselves? And surely if grape gatherers come to you, will they not leave a gleaning? How Esau has been searched out and his hidden things seized. All your allies force you to your borders. Men at peace with you oppose you and prevail against you. They sent an ambush below you. There is no understanding in them. In that day, says the Lord, I shall destroy the wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esau. And your warriors from Teman will be terrified in order that everyone from the mountain of Esau may be cut off. Hmm. The word, man. I just love the reading of the word. <laughs> <All right. clears throat> Man, the first thing that uh, that I think is worthy of note, because I, I mean, you did a great job of just read, reading through it. Um, I think the the first thing that is of note to me is first and foremost, uh, uh, like Obadiah starting off his message by making sure that the listeners know that what he's about to communicate, he believes, is coming directly from God. Mm -hmm. He's he's immediately cluing us in that that this message he's about to. Uh, relay he's, he believes is, is from the spirit of, of God. Um, and the thing that I, I think is important is that he's drawing out this, this clear distinction um, between, I imagine what is being seen from the physical realm. Mm -hmm. um, and he is, he is purposely juxtaposing that with what he is hearing from the spiritual realm. And so he's, he's evaluating a nation that quite clearly in his communication, he is saying this nation is very arrogant. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what I'm hearing from the spirit is going to be at odds with what we probably see, that the nation is, is probably, be, it has become arrogant because it has become powerful. And it is equating their power as if somehow they are um, immune from divine judgment. Oh, uh, yes. And so just, I think just that, like, before we get to the rest of the book, just know, seeing that dichotomy super clear is important that um, the physical reality is something that people are seeing. And I, I imagine most people of the day are on the same page. They, they are probably also thinking that Edom is a great nation. They, they are seeing how powerful they are and cannot possibly imagine a way in which this powerful nation could fall. But Obadiah is clearly speaking, the servant here is clearly stating that I know what it looks like, but I, I'm hearing in heavenly realm that this actually is the least among the nations in, in God's perspective. And, and there's about to be a big shift. And so, like, I imagine for most people, this was a truly prophetic message because there was uh, there probably wasn't much about what they were seeing that suggests that they weren't as powerful as they, they seem. But I'd love to hear what you have to think. Oh, 100 percent. It goes back to that analogy that or parable that people often give of the frog that's in the boiling water. Mm -hmm. The water is getting turned up in volume of heat slowly but surely. And there's no precise moment in which the frog knows that, you know, he's in danger. So he he's like, no, I'm fine. I can take a little more. I can take a little more. And then without knowing it, he could pass out. The same thing could be said of arrogant strong men like you and mm -hmm. I who try to compete with each other in a sauna. Maybe we're sweating with the Brodies in the sauna, trying to get fit, trying to get healthier, reduce causes of mortality. And mm. we're looking at each other like, yeah, I could do five more minutes. I could do 10 more minutes. Many UFC fighters have done that and found themselves passed out in the sauna. 
because they pushed themselves beyond uh, the point of no return. I, I'm a man of parables, so I'll give you another one. Mm -hmm. My friends and I, when we were in middle school, were mm -hmm. at the beach in Malibu where you and I studied for many years, and we would play this challenge of where can you go the deepest? You know, the people that were chaperoning us at the time told us, don't go past where you can stand. And we said, obviously, we're going to go past there. <laughs> at one point, I was about twice my body length at the time. I don't know how tall I was, maybe five, three, five, five. So I, I was probably 10 feet, 12 feet deep. And yeah. out of like the original 10 of us that were playing chicken and running mm -hmm. deeper and deeper into the, the so-called Pacific Ocean, uh, I, it was like two or three of us left. The next thing I remember seeing is a wave that I could no longer body surf or mm. boogie board and it wiped me out and my memory was gone for, mm. you know, I don't know how long I really, it could have been two minutes. It could have been 10 minutes. Um, and eventually I woke up, this is one of, you know, my first, you know, faces with mortality, the idea of death that carried, I carried with me and I carry with me to this day that, you know, makes me a man of action. Uh, I woke up on the, on the, I don't know what you call it, the little red pad of, uh, mm -hmm. of the lifeguard wow. along with my two friends. And so we tied, you know, nobody won that chicken because we all got knocked out by that wave and that lifeguard saved my life, saved everybody else. But how could it get to that point? Because mm. of my arrogance, because mm. of my haughtiness, because I thought I was above, because I thought it was stronger than the forces, the chaotic forces of water, which mm. God himself has to tame in the beginning in, mm. in Genesis. The original Hebrew always talks about the Mayim, the waters. It's like mm. the plural. It, it's this chaotic thing that that they were uh, afraid of. And, and I like to begin to more philologically to stamp your point from earlier. Mm. He says that he's receiving this vision from mm. God. And he, he says, thus says the Lord, not thus says Obadiah, thus says the Lord. And even Obadiah itself means uh, the Abd of Yah. Whenever you have, you know, El or Yah at the end, it's short for Yahweh or that name of God, that name of, of the Lord, which means, you know, I am or I am that I am, which is the right. name that, that he gave Moses when he asked, which is not really a name at all. You know, mm -hmm. just saying, I exist, I live, I am, you know, stop asking yeah. me my name. You know, don't ask me for my government. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. just worship me, just obey me, just live that, that life of the spirit that you were talking about earlier. So Abd means slave or servant. So mm -hmm. he's the slave of that God that was revealed to Moses, to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob. He's a slave or a servant of that deity, of that God. And he's saying he has a vision from that God and mm -hmm. that he is you know, pronouncing it. He's being the spokesman or the representative, which involves what you called the, the grounded reality. And that's really a way of Hebraic thought, but mm -hmm. that grounded reality in the physical that mm -hmm. talks about the metaphysical or the supernatural uh, right. judgment that is going to be forthcoming. And, and it's so beautiful, you know, I mean, we're also living in the midst of not only a global plague and pandemic, but yeah. of riots and rebellion that we yeah. see everywhere amongst us of Everything. all sorts of yeah. things being revealed and things being overturned. And yet still people think that the United States of America is going to last forever. Right. Only, only God's kingdom is forever. Only God's you know? kingdom is forever, yeah. That's a fact. <laughs> and I, I want to go back off of the, the, uh, the parable that, that you gave or the example. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like um, the example of you and, and your buddies trying to play chicken to see who could last the longest. I think that's that's a helpful insight to even give us new an, a, a fresh uh, set of eyes for this passage from like verse five to, to nine. Uh, there, God is saying like there if thieves came to you and by night you you'd be ravaged, they would take whatever they want. And I imagine for for the hearers of Edom of the day. They're looking at like, what are you talking about? Like, bro, we've got a, a strong military. We got <laughs> like, I'm looking to the left and then my right. Like my, I, in the same way as you were like, I'm not finna lose to my buddies. I'm like, no, like I know that I got, that I'm the man and my pride is going to push me on. And I can, and I actually think I'm stronger than them. And so, but I think the whole point is that you're looking at the wrong place to, for your defenses uh, in the same way. Like you guys should be looking out for living water. That, that can knock Amen. all you guys out and that will pillage you just like that. And because you're not in right alignment with God, you literally have no defenses from his judgment. And so when he appears, it won't be good news for you. It will be bad news. You know what I mean? And, and so just 
I think that again is like when we're looking in the physical realm, we're only thinking along the physical lines. So they're thinking like my defense system is is sure, like we're good, we're strong. We've risen to this point for a reason. Like we're actually cold in battle. We've got sharp minds in our government. We we got everything in place. We have an ordered society. We're good. So Obadiah, bro, keep keep doing your thing, but we're we're not listening to that. But obviously, you know, Obadiah was not talking about the invaders from the left and the right. There, God, he was talking about there's a God who can make it so your invaders for the left and the right can come and get you, even if you know that you're strong. Oh, he can come, you know? That yeah, that's the key part. Is like he's not quote unquote on the other side. He's not choosing sides. Yeah. He's on the side of Yahweh, mm -hmm. who is in control who is seated, who we know through later revelation is that paradoxical uh, shepherd yet sheep who sits, yeah. you know, on the throne. And is like you said, he is the one behind the rising and the falling of all yeah. the empires. So I, that, yeah, that's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. Thank you. So we could go on from verse 10. Where do you want to go from verse 10 to what? What's the next heading? Uh, next heading is Edom sins against Judah. And that's 10 through 14. All right, let's go here. <clears throat> Because of the slaughter and ungodliness against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you will be cut off forever. Because of that day in which you stood back and only watched the capture, his forces being led away as captives by foreigners, in the day when they entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, on that day you were as one of them. And you should not have looked on the day of your brother, on the day of foreigners, and you should not have rejoiced against the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor spoken boastfully on the day of distress. Neither should you have gone into the gates of the people on the day of their suffering. Neither should you have looked upon their gathering in the day of their ruin. And you should not have joined in the attack on their forces in the day of their destruction. Nor should you have stood at their mountain passes to put to death those escaping nor should you have taken prisoner those fleeing from them in the day of trial. Mm. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Uh, the, the first thing that came to mind, man, when, when you were reading, uh, was just the, the omnipresence of God. And I know that that's not necessarily an intuitive thought, but for me, it was the, reckoning, the, the realization that we have a God who's speaking in this passage, through, through his prophet, who is not only saying that I have seen the structural sins that have actually led to the desolation of some of my of, of, of my chosen people and, and the disenfranchisement um, and the injustices done toward my people. But I've also noticed your your internal mindsets. I've also noticed your your perspective. I'm there right there watching you and I'm watching your reaction to their suffering as well. So it's not just your initial sin. God says I'm also taking note of how you're reacting when, when they come into calamity. And so God is saying, when I show up, not only am I going to address the wrongs that were done against my people, I'm also keeping in mind exactly what your reaction was when my people were in distress. And now with, and now I want you to keep that, basically God is saying, and now I want you to keep that same energy. Keep just, <laughs> I'm about to show up, just keep the same energy, whatever, if that was funny then, let it be funny now. You know what I mean? And, and just, just noticing that's the kind of God you got. You know what I mean? Like, He's not just taking note of the wrongs. He's also taking note of the internal motivations, the internal thoughts of the oppressors as well. And God can even keep those things in mind, which is, I think, what makes him precisely the faithful judge is because all evidence is, at, is on the table. So when he's declaring a judgment, even if we don't fully see all of his reasoning, there, a part of our faith perspective allows us to believe that's the right judgment. Yeah, he has precedence since the beginning of time. Yeah. And then he starts and his, <laughs> realize the wisdom behind that presence. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It's, it's so beautiful the way that you said that. And I, I don't think it's inappropriate to talk about his omnipresence or his universality. The big pull, we always got to go back to the context. And the context of these people is they had deities that they would trap inside of buildings. Each little city has its own temple. And each of those temples, they have their statues or their idols where they like to trap the god. And the reason that they trapped them is because those are gods are not really gods at all. So really, they're making themselves gods because they're the ones talking. You know, the statue ain't talking to them. Or you whatever. Know, and, uh, yeah, unless they're on the local DMT at the time, the statue's not talking to them. So the thing about God is he had Jerusalem and he was there, 
but he's everywhere. He's not trapped there. We see that the most in Ezekiel and in the chariot when he goes around everywhere. Mm-hmm. But the universality or the omnipresence of God, that's absolutely right. And it reminds me how you're talking about the laughing or mocking. Psalm 2 talks about how the people who are, you know, the Jews or Israel are, you know, they're they're doing the wrong things, but there's mm-hmm. vanity in the mouths of the nations as well. So the people are hit. It's a double-edged sword, as we hear in Hebrews. The people are hit, but so are the peoples. The nation is hit, so are the nations. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the Jews and the Gentiles, everybody is cut by that sword. And eventually, it's because they're trying to go against his Messiah. Mm-hmm. And it says, one of my favorite lines in all of Scripture, he who is seated or enthroned in the heavens mm-hmm. laughs. <laughs> And the Lord derides them or mocks them and scoffs. So they're trying to scoff. They're trying to, you know, uh, shoot Mm. at their neighbors. And God says, y'all can't shoot. I'm the only one who's allowed to shoot. Wow. Yeah. And when you were speaking, I feel like when God shows up, he always comes with a double portion. And so for those who are rightly aligned with God, it'll be a double, double portion of comfort, a double portion of joy by heaven standards. But for those that were mocking and laughing, for those that were boasting in the wrong things, it'll be a double portion of of that as well of derision it'll be a double portion of sorrow it'll be a double portion of now you're the laughing stock you know and god is announcing that because like scripture says he's not wanting anyone to perish he has prophets for a reason to go out and spread the word to at least you you could say you, of course you guys were wrong but i even sent a messenger to let you know exactly what you were doing exactly where you had gone wrong and you still laughed and so now definitely keep the same energy <laughs> they have to they have to and even if we want to excuse mm-hmm. that so-called original audience who is hearing obadiah mm-hmm. after that we have the religious communities mm-hmm. not the samaritans and the sadducees because they only mess with the first five books but all the other different groups of jews in the first century the essenes the zealots the mm-hmm. pharisees all of them who accepted the book of the 12 mm-hmm. and then after them all the different 33,000 branches of Christianity. So now we have all those people in all those centuries and all those places who have now heard that message loud and clearly. And we know this is from God. We can't play like them and say, well, maybe he's from God, maybe he's not. Like we've already accepted that. So whatever judgment is on these original Edomites, Hmm. how much greater is that judgment upon us who who have more certainty? I know, you just said something. Wow, yep. Anything else in uh, 10 to 14 there that uh-huh. stuck out to you? Uh, I don't think so. Anything okay. else? What'd you say? I don't think so, but did anything else jump out to you? No, that that was good. I think we, we covered it uh, pretty thoroughly. Uh, the only other thing you can say is, you know, in verse 14, where it mentions, you know, the the mountain path, the passes that they have. Mountains mm-hmm. were always, you know, places of worship. So... It's a, it's a reminder not only of the military use of mountains, but also the worship use of that. And mm-hmm. then uh, some, some of the language earlier on from, from about maybe 10 to the end of 11, I, I try not to get too allegorical, but there's definitely portions where there are allegories. When you hear mm-hmm. the casts being lot, when, mm-hmm. when you hear about uh, within, the, within you know Jerusalem and you hear about the captives being held it, re- it reminds me of that that path of christ and how he you know how paul talks about i believe it's uh it's got to be either ephesians philippians or colossians so i got to be right through one of them where he makes a public spectacle of mm. the principalities and the powers yeah. so you know whenever i hear that that captive language mm-hmm. that comes to mind but anyway yeah we, we can move on what's the next heading from 15 to what uh 15 to 18 and that's judgment of the nations perfect which is what you were kind of saying before, nation to nations. Oh yeah, from singular to plural, every everybody could get that smoke. <laughs> right. For the day of the Lord is near against all the nations. For as you have done, it shall be done to you in the same manner. Your recompense shall return on your own head. For in the same way that you drank on my holy mountain, so too shall all the nations drink wine. They will drink and will be brought down. And it will be as if they never existed, but deliverance will come to Mount Zion and it will be holy. And the house of Jacob shall obtain their inheritance 
as their rightful inheritance. And the house of Jacob shall be the fire and the house of Joseph, the flame. But the house of Esau shall be the stubble and will be devoured in flames. And no one of the house of Esau will survive for the Lord has spoken. Mm. Wow. Heavy. That's a mic drop moment, like man. <laughs> I gotta listen to that. The them last four verses. Uh, <laughs> man. Wow, the day of the Lord. Um, like I think, uh, obviously throughout Scripture, the, the day of the Lord is mentioned at different times. But the day of the Lord is really always denoting a time where the Lord Himself is going to show up. Obviously, throughout human history, He's working through prophets working through people, anointing people, um, conforming his creations to his plans. But there are certain moments where God himself says, this is a task for me. You know, this is something worthy of, of literally me coming and, and acting something myself. Um, and as we said before, for, for those aligned with God, it's going to be, they're going to be drinking sweet wine. Mm. And, and But for those who aren't, they're going to be drinking that bitter wine. You know the that sort of wine that will make you stumble, um, stumble and and just lose your way. Um, and God is saying, like, you won't have a choice. Like, you will drink and gulp down. Like, you are going to consume what I have for you. There is no choice. This is just me announcing uh, what is going to be. But in the middle of that, all of a sudden, God also is starting to speak. In the middle of your very destruction, will also be the will literally be the rising of my people. Um, and that this will literally be a changing of the guard. And by divesting you will be the way in which I will can, will give back to my people what you have actually stolen. Um, and God is saying, um, and I, I think God has done that time and time again, but this also says that there, there is going to be a time where there will be no survivors of the house of Esau and that mm -hmm. there, won't, there won't ever again be in anyone that will be an Edom again. And so I think we see that happen in history, but I think it's also... Um, prophetic on a meta narrative level, um, that there will be a moment where, um, where that where that happens again, I, I believe. But uh, but yeah, I mean that's that's huge. This is literally judgment, and knowing um, that when God shows up, it it means either one or two things. It is either the greatest news <laughs> that I've ever dreamed, to, I've ever heard, and the greatest thing your eyes will ever see, or it'll be your worst day imaginable worse than anything you could possibly imagine. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I like that. You know, he he's functional. Mm -hmm. he, he That dichotomy or binary you set up, like the best of the best or the worst of the worst, he does that with everything. Mm -hmm. He takes water and he saves you mm -hmm. through water, but then he also floods you through water. Mm -hmm. wow. He takes the wind wow. and he could destroy you with the wind, with the tornadoes, mm -hmm. or... He gives you that calming breeze on a hot summer day. All, all, all the elements, the, the the fire, you know, there's a baptism of fire and then there's that fire you're trying to put out, mm. you know, the tongues of fire on Pentecost, which, uh, we're, you know, we celebrated in the Western tradition last Sunday and in our tradition, it's mm. this Sunday. Uh, it's like no matter what it is, the judgment itself, mm. some of the early writers of the church, I, I, I disagree with, you know, where they ultimately head in, in some of their views on on hell uh like isaac the syrian or gregory the theologian and origin but they had this idea where they would even you know talk about hell in that mm -hmm. way it, it's almost as if it's in the eye of the beholder or the perceiver or maybe more accurately it's in it what you have thought spoken mm -hmm. of and done is going to affect how you perceive yeah what is coming what is coming? What is coming? Is coming. Is you don't coming. know when, mm. but it is coming. He's coming to be more hands on. Like you said, he had his his lackeys, his minions, but yeah. now he's he's going to be hands on. Hands and, on. And, and woe to us if if we're not ready, right? Know, on that day, and it's very interesting to me because at this point, everybody likes to delineate. You know, who's of the house of Jacob and who's of the house of of Esau. And they want to say, we're in the house of Jacob. We're, you know, they're in the house of Esau. They're going to get destroyed. We're going to be saved. And what I like to remind my listeners is, don't be so certain. Mm. 
we have access to greater revelation and greater scripture where he said he could make sons of Abraham out yeah. of rocks. Mm -hmm. So if he can do that, out of rocks. then out of rocks. Who, who's really in the house of Jacob mm. is the one who hears scripture and, you know, is as obedient to it mm. as possible. And yeah, that and refiner's fire is coming. And, and Sorry, I just go got, ahead. No, just you speaking, I got a visual picture. I felt like, uh, I feel like a lot of times these these houses are have spiritual significance. So we're, we're thinking of it as uh, a, a spiritual house that's been built uh, that blocks out the light of the Lord and a spiritual mm -hmm. house that's been built that magnifies the light of the Lord. And that knowing because how society is set up, there are those who are in the house of Esau who are actually prisoners. Yes. That, that there, there, there are those who are searching for the light, who are actually stuck in a house that has literally been designed and built, but I think by principalities and some of the powers that God is gonna be uprooting in his visitation, um, that I think that's one of the ways in which, in which he does it. Um, and I think that, like that, that's helpful for me to think that even when, that, when he shows up, what that means for sure is the destruction of the house of Esau, but that doesn't necessarily necessitate that every single living being in the house of Esau will be destroyed. As a matter of fact, it could just mean that those who are who are responsible for the house of Esau will be will be destroyed with the house of Esau, but that those who may be trapped may be ushered into the house of Jacob, if that makes sense. Maybe ushered into that which is in more alignment with with God, um, and how I think this is a message that is for the nations, but is being discerned on an individual level. And, and God is saying, "Well, which house are you? E even if you are in the land of Esau, is your heart in the house of, of Jacob?" That, that's a beautifully put. The Semitic heart is is so key to understanding. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the, you know, the residents of Valentine's Day or Hallmark cards, but, nope. you know, in the anatomy of their day, they thought that that's where the thinking happens. Yeah. You know? So again, as we think about this, mm -hmm. the heart or the thoughts, where are the thoughts at? And mm -hmm. it's, it's so great as what you said, you know, when Rahab had all her destruction around her, her faith and righteousness allowed God to save her out of the situation that she was in. Mm. He didn't say, oh, you're from this set, so you're going to be destroyed. You're from the Esau set, you're going to be destroyed. You're Sodom and Gomorrah set. No, no, no. Let's find people who have some faith and some righteousness, mm. no, no matter which spiritual house, like you said, or exactly. set that they belong to. That's, that's great. Yeah. So you want to go from 19 to the finish here? Uh, yes. In which says future blessing for Israel. Nice. So yeah. I, I, I love that. Before we go into this section, it, it was a little bit present in the last few verses or the last heading we were in, but this heading is the most obvious. Oh, yeah. The way that the world works mm. is that they tell you all the good news up mm. front and then they say, but, and that yeah. but is a destroyer because yeah. anything that right. comes after that but is the bad news. Right. Right. And yet the way scripture works is the exact opposite. It starts off with all the bad news, mm. you know, and then it says, but, and here's the good news. So I, right. at least one point of application in my life, I always try to catch myself. If I have to present two types of news, I always try to go with the bad news first and end on the good news. Cause right. that's, that's what we're trying to leave on is, is that good news. Come on. Verse 19. And those who dwell in the Negev shall inherit the mountain of Esau. And those of the Cephala, the land of the Philistines, they will inherit the mountain of Ephraim, the plains of Samaria and Benjamin, and the land of Gilead, for the captivity of the sons of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanite as far as Zarephath, mm -hmm. the captivity of Jerusalem as far as Ephrathah shall possess the cities of the Negev, mm -hmm. and those who have been rescued shall ascend from Mount Zion to mm. exact vengeance on the mountain of Esau and mm. the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Mm. Wow. Boy, oh boy. Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like this is a, a natural outpouring from kind of what you mentioned, where it was kind of touched on a little bit in the section before. But I, but I think because we have people who have been so long in one circumstance, even when the news comes, it's hard for them to imagine what that what that new reality will look like. 
And so for them, God is saying, listen, I'm about to disinherit them all. Like, and, and y'all about to get it. <laughs> I was like, oh, they don't really get it yet. Okay, so let's keep talking. He said, y'all about to get, you know, the Nagab, the hill country, Esau, those Judean foothills. He's like, look, look, like y'all gonna get all of this. Like, cause he, I think he was realizing like they, they've been so long stuck in this, even if I say it, what they're actually going to receive is not going to be able to be presented in their minds. So I'm actually gonna paint the picture for them. And that's gonna be the thing that I want them to hold on to. They're gonna war with that word and, and trust me until, until this actually happens. But they will know that one day these particular pieces of land um, will literally be theirs. Um, and the way verse 21 is worded for me is, uh, in, or in this version, it says, saviors will ascend Mount Zion to rule over the hill country of Esau, but the kingdom will be the Lord's. And it's saying that God has a, a remnant almost in place, and, and they're going to be the ones that God has prepared in this season to actually uh, be the ones that steward this newfound abundance for people who have had scarcity for a long time. Um, and, and God has prepared them, and they're going to be the ones that will be will now rule over that which was oppressing them, but they'll they'll be ruling um, in complete alignment with God, um, which which is why we can end this 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 vision by saying, and this new kingdom that's coming, though you will literally be see humans that will be enacting these new leadership positions, oh, this new kingdom is going to literally just be the Lord's. Um, mm -hmm. And I imagine for people who are in oppression, for those who could grab on, you know, like grab a hold of this word, I mean, how comforting for those who could, who really could believe it. I mean, how, how comforting is that? Like, yes, we're in oppression. Yes, we're, we're, on, the, we're, we're on the fringes. Yes, we're not we're suffering injustice left and right, but there's a kingdom coming and we're about to be in charge of it. And we're about to get all the possessions. And this <laughs> gonna be the Lord. So if not only that, like our armed forces is the Lord of armies. Amen. That's, and so, so that's just like, man, for those who grab on, on a, a hold of that. And I imagine o Obadiah probably was living different now. He, he's getting his word. Crazy. He bet he better be, he better be. It, I mean, it's so great the way you say that all these so-called rulers, mm. leaders, these heads of state, these judges, mm. these princes, these kings, these presidents, these prime ministers are going to be wiped out. Wiped and out, in no. their place, you mm. have the shepherd king, God, who's mm. going to be the only one who's in charge, the only one who's leader. And as you said, a lot of this geography, I mean, there's so many Hebrew words in this geography. I'm like, I need to go consult a Hebrew lexicon to understand what half of these, you know, geographies mean. Yeah. But even though you and I might not get that yet on this reading, and we're going to have many readings, you know, down the line, this is not the last time we're reading Obadiah. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't just go one and done with the scripture. We right. keep, you know, chewing on it. Right. You know, whether we know those nitty gritties about these geographies, we understand the main picture of the vision, which is like w exactly what you said. You know, God is going to be the only one in charge, the only one ruling or, or leading in, in that time. And, and that's good it's his news. kingdom. Wow. That's good news. That's good news. Yeah, that that that's that certainly gives me hope. I'm glad yeah. it it gave you hope. Mm -hmm. So that's that's beautiful. We've uh, finished this section and we could, of course, Still keep conversing off camera. It's still recording, so mm. we could end it there. But I hate to put you on the spot, but I gotta mm. ask you, and don't mm. take it as too much gas, because mm. one of the things we skipped over that's very unique about the Church of Christ culture mm. is, and, and I know you may have different views than necessarily the lowercase o orthodoxy amongst them, but this, let's say, to put it politely, this emphasis mm -hmm. on a cappella worship. Mm. Yes, and that emphasis is also found in the orthodox traditions the ethiopians are strange amongst the orthodox because we're the black orthodox so we got our drum you know we're africans we got our drum still but even our drum we don't hit it during the liturgy we mm. we do it after the liturgy and traditionally it was done you know outside settings mm. and even today there are some monasteries that prohibit the drum mm. you know some people even ethiopians are sometimes surprised to hear that but i i could name at least two monasteries i know of yeah, they prohibit it. They say the drum is too worldly, mm. which is funny because the people in the same church, they don't do it. But anyway, the, the reason I bring it up is this emphasis on a cappella. And if you could bless us and, and my listeners with any any of the a cappella 
hymns or, or spiritual songs that you grew up in? Oh, it's like an actual little, like a small selection. Oh, okay. Wow. This Anything. Yes, I've never seen this level before. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I have a tattoo. You can't see it, but I have a tattoo here that uh, says, Had it not been the Lord, which comes from Psalms 124. Mm -hmm. that, was, that I was just reflecting on earlier. So I'll just give us a verse of that. Or actually, I'll, let's read it first. Mm -hmm. it's, it's fairly short. And then Please, uh, go ahead. And then. Um, and then I'll I'll sing part of the selection. Psalms one, two, four. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, mm. So, all right, here we are. It's beautiful. As you're flipping to it, it's um I found as generations have changed, this is our boomer moment. Mm. You know, younger Christians are only used to the iPhone or the Android version, so yeah. they just go straight to it. You give them a physical Bible, some of these young cats, they don't know where the Psalms are in mm -hmm. the Bible. You know, they used to teach me, I used to go to like a Lutheran school too, and they would teach us these techniques. Like you open it in half, that's Old Testament, New Testament, open this half, this got Pauline letters, the non-Pauline letters over here, go over here, this the prophets, this the whatever. The, you know, they give you little tricks yeah. of how you got to find it. Just like we grew up, you know, with the physical dictionaries and encyclopedias. So... Uh, I just appreciate that part of, of culture and as, as it's changing. So go ahead for us and read the psalm. Yes. Uh, the Lord is on our side. Uh, if the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say, if the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us, then they would have swallowed us alive in their burning anger against us. Then the water would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging water would have swept over us. Blessed be the Lord. Who has not let us be ripped apart by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the hunter's snare. The net is torn and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Psalms 124. <laughs> Had it not been the Lord who was on our side, had it not been the Lord who was on our side, I, the anger of the enemy would have swallowed us alive. Had it not been the Lord who was on our side, blessed be the Lord. Who would not give us up? Blessed be the Lord for his unfailing love. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the Lord. Amen. 